Okay, well, I want to thank the African School of Physics for this wonderful opportunity to give a talk and also thank all of the people who are attending. I am Simon Connell. I'm in South Africa at uh, University of Johannesburg. And I work in particle physics, nuclear physics, quantum physics, innovation physics, and so on. And also work in service of the discipline. Particularly, my interest is that we should advance a vision of a pan-African Africa that can take its place as a world leader, really, in research. So that's enough about me. I want to just say in making these slides, I'm very fortunate to be in a group that I've listed there. Actually, some of them are engineers. Um, Prof Naidu, he's working with me in this section. We call our group the Nexus Group. I've put a link to it in the top and I welcome you to visit there. <clears throat> if there are any students who would like projects, please see in the same Indico page, I put the projects and note that if you prefer more economics or commercialization even, <clears throat> or to study the economics of energy, even the politics of energy, some of these colleagues of mine are doing that and they're really hunting for students. So uh, please just write to me if you would like to study anything really from um, even particle physics aspects. I put our paper that was just published, uh, it's um, also there on using Giant 4 to model nuclear reactors. And uh, we, we have um, really a very broad spread of projects. And if you would join the group, you would meet all of these very, very nice people that you see there. Some names you may know. Dr. <clears throat> Bundy and Susan was a colleague of yours from African School of Physics. Uh, Bongani Makwabuka, I don't know if he did attend the ASP, but also um, a young emerging researcher. And Rotondwa Mudao. <clears throat> so these are people that maybe you know. And I just want you to feel invited to look at the, the ball or the globe on the right there that shows Africa and just see how very beautiful it is. And you really get the feeling that all that the earth is, is like a spaceship, honestly, in a very harsh environment. And we have to keep it beautiful we have to keep it sustainable. And so we have to make the right decisions. So this talk is about those decisions and especially Africa is the continent in focus there. That's our continent. So I really want you to see how very beautiful it is as well, especially Africa. And, and then I put in the title, if you love your planet, okay? so. There's a lot of myths about uh, nuclear energy. And so if you love your planet, I invite you to think about this material. It's not going to be material that uh, is deep physics, but it's presented maybe in a new way and collecting new ideas together. The second talk is the one where I'll dive really into the latest most amazing advances in uh, reactors. So this, this part of the talk I'm calling setting the scene. I just wanted to start with this slide. It's slide two, I, I hope it's there. And I highlighted that if Africa is to become wealthy, wealthy, that's what we want, Africa to become wealthy, it will need a lot of energy really a lot. Apologize to ladies that this slide says man all the time. If, if I had more time, I will change it. I didn't make this slide, but I think it's very offensive that it says 
man all the time, which is stupid, but let's concentrate on what it says. And really the message is it's almost logarithmic scale that um, you, you see that we need so much energy if we are to be wealthy. As you go from long ago, primitive hominids, hunter gatherers, and so on and so on until you come to where we are now, I really want to emphasize, you know, a lot of people say, well, we must save energy. I, I don't want us to save energy. I want us to get a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. If you save energy, you can save 10%, 20% makes absolutely no difference. Yes, it's a good idea, save energy. I don't want to knock it. But saving energy will not save the planet. You have to do things completely differently. And you still want a lot of energy, especially for Africa. So I reproduce here the abstract that I really want to emphasize. You know, it's a big continent. And only South Africa and Egypt on opposite ends have nuclear reactors. And... I also want to emphasize, don't think just electricity, okay? This new thing is process heat for desalination, the hydrogen economy, energy carriers like the synthetic fuels. And also there's so much flexibility now, you can have a one kilowatt reactor and you can have gigawatts of reactors. And in Africa, we have a very poorly developed grid. You can't go and stick a gigawatt. You should try to have a rule of thumb that whatever energy source you put there must be less than 10% of the local grid consumption there. Otherwise, it's just too big. There, there are people in our group who are grid experts. It's an amazing field to just look at the physics, the engineering of the grid. You cannot do whatever you want with powerful reactors, sometimes you need moderate ones to start with. And then you enter the small modular reactor, SMR, okay? And these now are so safe that they are called fail safe, walk away safe. Shoot all the operators in the head, drive a fly, a Boeing right on top and it must shut down safely and they can do that. They live nearly longer than a human, okay? It's incredible to think, you know, the, uh, the other power modalities are claiming 25 year lifespan, but we haven't seen it yet. They still got to prove it to us, but there are nuclear power stations getting life extensions now to 80 years. You just keep that in mind, it's very, very important, you know? And you'll see that there are designs that you fuel them once, once, just imagine that. Okay, so those are all the things we want to talk about. Uh, and also the so socioeconomic thing. Now, now this is a, a quote from um, Dave Nichols, okay? And I just want to emphasize, he's just became a professor, office next door, and he also chairs the board of Nexa, that's our nuclear energy corporation. And also he's the chief nuclear officer just retired from that of ESCOM. And um, it's very interesting, okay, but in this um, part, he is talking about uh, myths, really. Why is there a belief, a current belief? The world has this belief now, it's absolutely nuts, that we must go to decentralized, deregulated, embedded generation buzzwords and we must move away from centralized and regulated and so on and the economy is changing to adapt to this okay and we've got to unpack what what do these words mean okay and the question that we're asking is is this all a mirage okay I like to call it the emperor's new clothes. This is the story where 
there's a dictator and always doing the latest fashion. And one day he's tricked into uh, not wearing any clothes, but he thinks he is. And um, this cartoon is very recent. It's about uh, the Boris, whatever, um, Johnson in England, it's supposed to look like him. Okay, so this is the emperor's new clothes. Um, and, and is this what's happening now in energy? Okay. And then these are the questions. What is the new grid? What is the old grid? Why do we need the new grid? Why does the new grid need the old grid? Why do we believe these things? Is there evidence? And so on and so on and so on. Those are things we want to ask. So, so I put them juxtaposed here, okay? The old grid is the concept of a copper plate that spans the country. And you can put energy in and take energy out wherever you want. That's, that's essentially the old grid. It's an infrastructure that already exists in many places. The, the closest to the copper plate is thought to be Europe. Okay, now the new grid doesn't care so much about the structure of the old grid. Um, the new grid is distributed, deregulated. You nearly only think of wind, solar and batteries. It's environmentally friendly, low carbon, flexible and low cost and fair. This is really the claim, okay, this is the claim. And when I talk about the old grid, inefficient, expensive, polluting, inflexible, and very bureaucratic. Now, this is from South Africa, very recent, okay, modeling. Um, the, bottom, the bottom right, I want to show you this black line. Uh, each period that you see is a day, one day. And this curve is very famous. It goes up and it's the morning peak and then goes down for the midday slump, and then it goes up for the afternoon peak. I think you see my mouse. Morning peak, afternoon peak, nighttime. Morning peak, afternoon peak, nighttime. It looks like a duck. Here's a little nice duck. Uh, the morning peak is its tail, and the afternoon peak is its head. And this is called the duck curve, and there's one duck every day. And those are typical plots made by the energy utility. They'll look very similar, but actually this is a mathematical model. And so the black would be, let's say, what South Africa is consuming daily basis, hourly basis. And then if we were where the government wants us to be with renewables, if we were, okay, that would be the red. Now the renewables, they are like this gray here. They peak in the, in the midday slump. So the renewables are out of step with the demand. And also they can be too much or too little. So there can be a surplus, which is this pale blue. And then you have to back up the renewables. So you've got this blue over here, and that's what you ask your grid to do to go and fill in for the renewables. This is a very, very important concept. When you buy wind and solar, in actual fact, you must buy 100% backup. Of course, you may only need it for three days of the entire year. And um, that's the variability is that on, on the year time scale, there may be changes from 0% to 100%, 0% to 100. That happens. The wind cannot blow, the sun cannot shine, and then you are stuck. And you go to the wall and you press the light switch and nothing happens. You can't have that. So you need 100% backup. Even if you use it three days in the year, you must have 100% backup. Normally, that is given by the old grid, the aging fleet, 
of fossil or some nuclear if France is nearby, whatever. Hydro, if you're lucky. So, so basically, um, you need this backup. And what South Africa wants to do is the open cycle gas turbine. That means you must also put in gas pipes. That means you must find a gas field. And that means you must keep at least a three day supply of gas in big gas tanks. Then you can have your open cycle gas turbine. The price of gas is very fickle. One, one knows that the energy price will jump up and down as soon as that happens. And so I'm just pointing out, don't forget, if you have renewables, they both variable and intermittent. And this other word, dispatchability, uh, that, what does that mean? It means that you can make the duck curve. When it's the head of the duck, you give the head of the duck. When it's the tail of the duck, you give the tail of the duck. But you must have power to dispatch when you need it. So now uh, let's look at, at um, why do we have this concept about renewable energy and the new grid and so on. The things I've actually mentioned, I don't have to spend too long, but Renewable energy is thought to have an ability that it can meet all loads and grid stability requirements. Renewable energy is connected to the grid by an inverter and the inverter has no momentum. It's a very important grid concept is that if you had fossil or hydro or nuclear, there would be a big rotating machine, a BRM that they call it. The big rotating machine is the generator and it's got tremendous inertia and the seconds and minutes variation because when the sun goes behind a cloud, it's seconds. From one second to the next, you can lose 50% on your solar field. So there's a second variation uh, you won't see it on the hourly graph, but there's a seconds time scale of 50% variation. And this is these big rotating machines. They are what stabilize the grid. As you get more and more renewable penetration, you lose that. There is not yet a commercially available technology for virtual inertia on the grid from renewables. It does not yet exist. It's an active field of research, but does not yet exist. So now um, people uh, are, are very prone to thinking all these nice things about the modern energy economy because they look at renewable energy and they saw a rapid roll out. Why? Because there's so much state support and subsidies. But I really want to point out this thing called a sovereign guarantee. You'll get business people uh, all over, and we must be careful of that in Africa, that they issue a sovereign guarantee. So in the example, South Africa did that, unfortunately. So we will say to a um, wind power producer that we will buy their windmill install it and pay them a fixed price whether it operated according to that or not. They will be guaranteed that. It's like if you're an entrepreneur, let's say you have a new product, a new kind of hair dryer, who knows, and someone says you will have a sovereign guarantee for 25 years Everyone has to buy your hair dryer. You, you have now gone away from capitalism. It's, it's a myth that there are market forces because you have given a sovereign guarantee. If someone else comes with a better windmill, you can't buy it. You are stuck for 25 years paying a certain technology that you bought up to 25 years ago. 
and you don't have market forces. It's a myth because one of, the, one of the things people are claiming is that the state owned enterprise is a terrible animal because it's too big and can't respond to market forces and so on. Exactly the same for a sovereign guarantee. Once you give the independent power producers a sovereign guarantee, you basically have gone back to a state owned enterprise. Anyway, that just a, a by the way, one has to really unpack all of these things. And then um, the levelized cost of energy, the ancillary services, I mean the 100% backup, also the grid. So renewables say we do this thing called handover. When it's not windy at place A, it's very windy at place B. So we just hand over. Same with the sun shining, place A, place B. So there's a cloud here, but not there. So if you have a copper plate grid, you can do handover. Otherwise you cannot do handover. If there's not yet such a grid, that cost should really be placed at the door of renewables because you're not going to ask that cost unless you have to do handover. The levelized cost of electricity should have the cost of grid, which means distribution and transmission. It's very, very important. People often only look at generation and they forget the others and they forget the backup. So <clears throat> that is really thought to be the reason that the price of electricity went up to three times in Germany, three times, because there are these hidden costs in renewable. Okay, I, I emphasize that on this line, that cost is generation, transmission, distribution. And then uh, rapid evolution of digital technology. So um, uh, people in the renewable lobby, they will uh, talk about a, a smart grid where you have lots of sensors on the grid and they collect big data and process it with AI and have intelligence. And then you have fast switches, which don't exist yet technologically, but they will have them and, and um, households will be set up to be dual circuit, dirty circuit, clean circuit, space heating, water heating is the dirty circuit. And then the fast switching will uh, use the dirty circuit to smooth the grid. So, that's a dream, it doesn't exist yet. It will be great if it does exist. There's no country which has it yet. I wanted to show you now why all these beliefs are suspect. Okay. Sorry, Prof, um, uh, just before you move on, I just wanted to ask about like um, other African countries that have, uh, are there other African countries that are issuing sovereign guarantees like South Africa has? It's basically the model of the IPPs, I'm afraid. Okay, so, so um, the synchronous machines are, are playing a role on the grid, okay? But if you penetrate too much renewable, you lose those guys. And their wear and tear is tremendous. In Germany, they're remaining synchronous machines are aging very rapidly because they, they power cycling like you saw in that picture. And that means they temperature cycling. And, and also all this new stuff, it doesn't have grid built into it. In South Africa, that will catch us badly. And grid stability, uh, et cetera. Um, and then also not understanding the transmission and the distribution. I've got a picture there of a big rotating machine. You can imagine how small a human is next to that. I, I have been next to these big rotating machines and um, they are really impressive. If you stand next to one gigawatt of energy coming out of a armature, uh, you, you really know that it is capable of smoothing the dirty power. 
Okay, so um, they also believe in batteries, but the lead acid battery is in your brand new car. Buy one tomorrow and it's not going to be a lithium battery in it. It's going to be a lead acid. And that was invented in 1859. And it's five times more expensive than pumped storage. But still, people talk about lead acid batteries. Also, what about storage? Imagine you have um, a farm producing two gigawatts and you've got to smooth out the duck. So you get your energy in midday and you want to keep it for the evening. So you must take two gigawatts and store it for six hours. While well, not saying store it for three days, while well, storing two gigawatts for six hours. So if you calculate two gigawatts for six hours, how much energy? It's 10 kilotons of TNT. It's 1% of Hiroshima. So you would not really want to store electricity. It's absolute madness. You must produce electricity on demand. You must do this thing called load following. There should never be storage of electricity. So, so then you have um, smoothing out. This is the intermittency and the variability. So then they wanting to do geyser control, space heating and load shedding. And those are things that are the enemy of, of progress. And if people go uh, without guarantees, it's going to basically collapse the independent power producers. So you either have them happy or the utilities happy. You can't have both and so on. So um, the next one I emphasize, you have variations, seconds, minutes, hours, and days. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize in the next bits is to try to put numbers in. And I, I, I want to just emphasize, we're going to have to think Terra, not Giga, okay? Um, oh, he says one more slide on this theme. Here's a graph of the price of electricity depending on renewable penetration. And it just goes up and up and up. It's, um, the more renewables you have, the more you pay for electricity. And this right-hand graph breaks it down. You have the dispatchable power, which is the fossils and the nuclear and the hydro, and then the non-dispatchable ones that you take what nature gives you. And the non-dispatchable ones really need the grid. And when the grid is not there, they have these hidden costs, the connection costs, the grid costs, the balancing costs, and the utilization costs. And then you see why the non-dispatchable modalities are going to push up the price. This is again just an, another um, version of the, the similar graph. Uh, all, all different sources and, um, and, and, and basically it's the experience of countries. Sorry, Prof. Uh, can you please explain what balancing costs are? The handover. When, it, when there's more power in one region than in another region. Okay. There's a very, very delocalized uh, distribution and you can't load follow. So you have to hand over. Okay. Now, um, this is another graph where our continent is down here at the bottom. Okay, data up to 2019. And we are using 5,000 terawatt hours a year. Um, then um, Asia is double America, okay? Uh, more than double the Asian tiger. I think Katebe, you must get your country to start using more energy. And and you see Africa is right down here. And so if we want Africa to be wealthy, we got to push the power up all the way to there. 
this is a, another view of it. Um, so, so many different views. This is the per capita view. I want you to see, you can't get lower than Africa, folks. We are really down. And so we have to get our power consumption up. No one can tell us we must use a little. We want to use a lot. Africa's total installed electrical capacity is 170 gigawatts and USA is more than five times that. But our population is much more than theirs. So if we want to just be where the USA is, we want 20 times more power. Don't let anyone say we must be efficient and we must save. We want 20 times more. We don't want to save 10% with the energy efficient light bulb. We want 20 times more power. That means when we think of a solution, that solution must scale. You know, I mean, it's a word we use in physics a lot. That, that must really scale. So now we're going to look at our <laughs> options. And <clears throat> we're not going to think about watts. We're going to think about terawatts. And I want you to just keep in mind, it's 10 to the 12 of those watts. When we want to scale, <clears throat> we must think, does nature have enough resources? Is there really enough stuff in nature if we want terawatts of battery? Is there that much lithium? I just heard that cobalt is mostly in the Congo and everyone's going to fight and fight over the Congo because the most important part in the lithium battery is actually the cobalt. Does nature have enough? If you take a windmill, you need 20 tons of rare earths for the permanent magnet. 20 tons of rare earths per windmill. One windmill is a few megawatts, but we want millions of windmills. We want terawatts. So you have to think, how does it scale? Is there that much rare earths on planet Earth for us to think we can use windmills, batteries? What is the safety when we scale? What's the environmental impact? Can we dispatch the power? And storage, do we really want to think about storage? So those are all the issues we're going to keep in mind. And I have only a little bit of physics. So this is one piece of physics. And for me, this says it all. This is, I think I will build my whole case on why I fell in love with nuclear. From this slide, when you do a fission, you release about 220 MeV per uranium nucleus, but you can capture and heat up things with 200 of that. There's 200 usable MeV per atom. M stands for million. Now here's the electronic system of the atom. We just rearrange bonds. The electrons orbit around something else. So this is the electronic system and this is the nuclear system. And now, we just burn methane, so you can follow this graph and see it's net exothermic by 802 kilojoules per mole. You can convert that to 8.4 electron volts per atom. So nuclear makes millions of electron volts, hundreds of millions, and electrons make only electron volts. Coal is four EV per atom and so on. So there's a multiplier here in the title. It's between 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight. Different people are believing different things. I don't care, call it 10 to the seven. It's a lot, it's a lot. 
the energy in the nucleus is awesome. So here's 10 grams of uranium. It's this dot. And it's some tonnage of coal. And this makes all the difference. When I look at the waste of coal, it's going to come from a tonnage. When I look at the waste of nuclear, it's going to come from a pinhead. So the tonnage is going to give me all of this ash and carbon dioxide. I will have a huge waste problem. This picture over here uh, takes the point further. You will say, ah, coal is not radioactive, but it has one part per million of uranium in coal a trace element concentration. You will never know it's there. One part per million of uranium in coal. Then I have to use a hundred million more of it. Now I must multiply a part per million by a hundred million. And then I'm going to get my tonnage of uranium released into the air per year. That means when I compare the radioactivity of my nuclear station to a coal station, I'm going to find the nuclear one is a hundred times less activity release than coal. And that multiplier, it applies everywhere. It applies to the safety, it applies to the waste, it applies to every single thing. In South Africa, we put the nuclear power station in the Cape because our coal is up in the north. And the, the energy to take the coal down to the south is a huge proportion of the energy in the coal. So coal is a very diffuse source. And, and so, um, yes, we don't want it because it's low carbon. So, because it could make carbon dioxide, but let's dispense with coal. Let's just look at hydro, wind and solar and nuclear. Capture these few points on them. The hydro, you need a river. And then there's this word I haven't yet introduced. It's the capacity factor. I'm all the time being generous now because nuclear always says, let everyone come in the mix. Nuclear never says no hydro, no wind and solar. The other people say no nuclear, but it's not nuclear who says no hydro, no wind and solar. And let's even be generous. Their capacity factor is 40%. It means you can install one gigawatt of, of hydro, but on average, it will only deliver you for 400 megawatts. The same with wind and solar. I'm going to say 40% and 30% for wind and solar. The wind and solar is variable and intermittent and needs 100% backup. It's very diffuse. You need lots of plant to harvest it. You must put lots of windmills with lots of rare earths, lots of aluminium, lots of what, what, what that you've got to put in the windmill. And the same with with uh, solar, lots of steel, lots of aluminium, lots of smelting using energy to make the, the silicon pure, et cetera, et cetera. A lot, because there's not much intensity in the sunlight or the wind when you compare it to nuclear. And this point will be made very quantitatively. And I also want to put the lifetime is very important. And this lifetime is not yet proof for wind and solar, but let's be generous. They claim 25 years, so that's the number. So now um, nuclear is so dense form of energy, power density, extreme. You can put it anywhere you like. You can put it in Cape Town. You are not like coal. You have to stick it in the north, no. Put it wherever you want it. And nuclear's capacity factor is 90%. Again, I'm being generous. You get numbers like 98% even. So now let's try and compare these guys uh, together. 
he has the world's biggest hydro and it's why you can really like hydro okay this is one dam one dam making 22.5 gigawatts this one dam is two-thirds of of um south africa you can take the that river in the congo okay the name just skipped my mind is the best river in the whole world you can get about 100 gigawatts out of that river without damming it it's the most beautiful river in the entire world if you wanted to make make uh, energy out of it and uh, i didn't put a picture of it in but you can google where the river forks um it goes in a fork and 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 that's very nice because you dam the other fork no you don't dam it it's runoff river you just stick your turbines in the water runoff river but you do it in the other fork and then all the um biodiversity can swim around in the fork you haven't put them in and you are going to get the entire energy needs of africa out of that one river so hydro will be your first choice why um oh it's the inga river folks the inga river in the congo and if you follow it uh, in google you'll find the fork where where africa union would love to dam it but we don't have political stability to 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 send that electricity around africa is not considered uh, possible at the moment you would first have to unite africa you you you, you can't have a country have 100 percent of its power coming from a place if there is not political stability so this concept of energy security is what is stopping the exploitation of the inga river i just want to emphasize it's the nicest hydro source that you could ask for on planet earth but um if you look 22 gigawatts for this one and 1084 kilometers squared so that will be a metric uh, that that if you if you want to see how much land must you set aside for different modalities then you get about 20 megawatts per kilometer squared from a dam this is the biggest solar park in the world it's 2.25 gigawatts and it gets 40 megawatts per kilometer squared it's very beautiful as well and this is the biggest wind farm in the world and it is giving 10 megawatts per kilometer squared and now let's look at a nuclear power station so this is two gigawatts okay and it's minuscule it's very pretty and it's minuscule so this is the energy density of of the nucleus this is the energy density of the nucleus it's like the solar farm but it's a tiny 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 fraction of the land utilization it's a tiny fraction of the plant concrete what what whatever you may want it's a tiny tiny fraction so when you come to understand um uh, this and you want to ask what can scale what what doesn't consume too much raw materials and uh, what gives you enormous power doesn't need much space you're going to come to nuclear then this is um, a summary um, of what i've been talking about and and now i just want to put to bed the cost thing um people can uh, argue forever over cost uh, you you know uh, this thing called levelized cost you you try to compare apples with oranges using the levelized cost of electricity you can have all your modalities there but i just want you to to look at the um total here in this column and 
And when, when you look at this column, you know, imagine error bars, folks. We have error bars. And everything is going to come round about 100. Solar can say they got cheaper than someone else can say, but you didn't put your backup and you didn't put your storage. You didn't put your intermittency. You didn't put your grid, what, what. People can fight forever, okay? The biggest thing that changes these costs in the economics is the, the capital cost. It makes the, the biggest difference. And the, the one most unfairly treated in the capital cost is nuclear. No one will lend you money more than 20 years, 25 years. If you buy your house, you must pay it off within 20, 25 years. Actually, humanity can't understand capital borrowing longer than 25 years. Whenever I find an economist, I take this point up with them because it seems so crazy. The, the nuclear power station is going to last 80 years. Why can't you do your sum over 80 years? Why must you do it over 25 years? These numbers in the levelized cost is always putting the capital on the same time scale. And, and I know of people who have recalculated it. And I believe that they must be right. Right now, Kuburg is touching on 40 years and it's getting its life extension to 60 years. Even um, colleagues of ours are involved in that, right? And, and now, Kuburg is most likely going to get to 60 years and then to 80 years. Now it is paid off. Kuburg is paid off. Life extension is covered in the operating cost. Kuburg is 20 cents a kilowatt hour and solar is saying it will come in at 80 cents a kilowatt hour. That's what they say. Whereas they don't include all the things I told you they should. <clears throat> so nuclear is coming in at 20 cents a kilowatt hour, one quarter, if we believe the greens of what they say theirs will come in at. We are paying about one rand 50 a kilowatt hour in South Africa. So nuclear is something like seven times cheaper than the price of electricity. And that's the main thing that is making our government think again about nuclear. Because if you have poverty in your country, why do you want to subject them to a more expensive electricity price? It's madness. The trade unions are firmly behind nuclear. The government is nailing its colors to the mast more and more in South Africa about nuclear. So it's a very, very, very important point comparing as much as you can apples to apples when you have apples and oranges and people disagree. And that's why I prefer to say, okay, Let's, let's not argue. We all cost 100 in this table here. All of us, we are $100 per megawatt hour. We are 100. We don't care. And, and um, <clears throat> if we end up to be half that, one quarter that, we won. But let's not fight about these different modalities in terms of price. I'd rather we look at those other things that um, the dispatchability and the natural resources and so on. Okay, I, I want to say, I think I'm coming in on time. I uh, have uh, nine more slides that I want to do. I, I wanted to move more and more towards nuclear now that we have discussed the price and so on. And um, our colleague, Susan Vumbi, she has supplied me the next slides and they are mostly about the waste. And we, we have um, spoken about cost and so on and consumption of space 
on the surface, the, the, the area that you need and so on, and the scaling. And so now I want to talk about these nuclear nightmares. They well known, the three, they are there, proliferation, waste and accidents. And proliferation happened. So um, both um, India and Pakistan bought the Kandu reactor from Canada and both had in one year a weapon. And they bought the Kandu because you can make a weapon after you bought the Kandu. And now uh, Canada will be more careful and try and engineer it that that's more difficult. But proliferation, it was a nightmare. So let's, let's not say it was not a nightmare. It was a nightmare. But how much of a nightmare is it? When Fukushima's plume was released, they could find plutonium in California. Why? Because of Avogadro's number. If you release a plume, you will release something on the scale of Avogadro's number. And if you put a detector, you're going to detect single atoms. That's how good physics is. So your lever arm of detection is Avogadro's number. And this is the telltale signs. There's nowhere to hide in nuclear. Absolutely nowhere to hide. If something you say is leak tight, is it leak tight to one over Avogadro's number? No. One over Avogadro's number, you cannot achieve that level of leak tight. There will be leakage of fingerprint species and you will find them. Stick your detector in the river, going in the sea, downstream of that facility, and you will find one divided by Avogadro's number is leaking. Other things you, you know, uh, um, when, you, when you want to make a weapon, you make the auto-fissioning isotopes more slowly than the fissioning ones. And so you've got to keep pulling your fuel rods out um, very, very often on, on almost a daily basis and chemically separate before you get the auto-fissioning isotopes. And that's a lot of work. And so you have to modify the fuel handling system. And again, there will be telltale isotopes that you are doing that. So, so proliferation, you, you actually easily see. I mean, there's even a movie now that America was bullshitting when it went looking for weapons of mass destruction. The scientists knew there were none. So <clears throat> the waste I will talk more about and accidents. Um, this is a very emotive subject, but um, I, I haven't put much on it here, but the point is no one died at Fukushima, zero. And even you can take the green figure of how many died in Chernobyl and that uh, Netflix movie of Chernobyl and say you believe them and use those numbers and you'll still find less dead than with solar. And, and you just have to go to um, the insurance people and see what are they charging you to insure uh, um, occupational hazard if you're working in solar compared to nuclear. It's going to tell the story. Okay. So, so anyway, I didn't do much on, on that. But now um, that we're moving to nuclear, I wanted to say another thing about it. Nuclear is not forever. There's something else on the horizon. Okay. It could be fusion. It could be a tame black hole like Hawkins want us to believe. Who knows what is a hundred years away? I do not believe nuclear will be used longer than 100 years. So nuclear is not forever. Please think about that when we talk about waste. And a hundred years is round about the lifetime of one reactor. Okay. Now we live in Africa, so we have our nice gem. This is a, the first nuclear reactor. 
it's a natural one. There's a plot here pointed with my mouse. You see U235 and U238, they've got different lifetimes by a factor of five or so. And so the U235 used to be more abundant. If U235 and U238 were made in thermal equilibrium, as people believe in a supernova, this is what you're going to see. And then uh, the U235 is decaying faster. So we are at weapons grade early on. We dominate with U235 and then it decays away and we get to reactor grade some billions of years ago. Then all the uranium ore bodies were reactor grade. No one had to enrich them. And here is an ore body of uranium and it is exposed at the surface and is a large ore body, 50 to 70 percent. And it was three percent enrichment, just like a modern reactor two billion years ago. Now, water flowed over it, the Oklo River, and did the moderation. And then it boiled off the water. No more water, no more moderation. It switched off, cooled down, Water flowed again, remoderated it, and it started up again. So they say that it fizzed on and off, on and off, periodically boiling off the river. And it fizzed for 500,000 years. This is 500,000 years of nuclear reactor. And you can go and study it now and you can calculate the depletion of U235. So the geologists go here and they say, hmm, the, it must have had this thermal release, X. Then you say, ah, oh, with this thermal release, we expect so many fission fragments. And when they prospect within two kilometers of Oklo, they recover all fission fragments, all. There are no missing fission fragments. And, and so it's a very, very nice laboratory to study storage of waste and fixing of waste chemically. And this led to the idea of vitrification of waste because also in Oklo was natural vitrifying minerals and they promoted under the thermal release, the vitrification, which is chemical confinement of the waste. So that is an interesting one. Here, he has another interesting one. Uh, Enrico Fermi is one of these guys. And people are standing here next to the reactor and other people are sitting on top of it and so on. This is 1942 in University of Chicago yeah. as the first reactor. And here is a modern one, but we would call it now Gen 3. And we are on gen three and a half. So that means hardened against natural catastrophes with more layers, uh, defense in depth. And you see the features, you see the pressure vessel, you see the control rods, you see the fuel element, you see the water, which is primary coolant, but also moderator. So I have some more physics here. This is the cross section for fission as a function of neutron energy and they born in this energy and they have thermal down here. And the cross section is going up by orders of magnitude uh, from 10 zero to, to is, is, is several thousand orders of magnitude. And so the cross section only becomes high when the reactor becomes cool. If you heat the reactor too much, your cross section will die away and this is the origin of the temperature coefficient of activity. And most reactors, as they get hotter, they become uh, less critical. So um, what I, I would like to say is um, there are a lot of physics in how a reactor works because of these thermal dependencies and so on. It's really, really, really rich in physics. 
and you can fiddle with the physics to give you all of these effects so that by physics, the reactor becomes safe. If I now build the reactor out of refractory materials and I operate it hot, deliberately hot, uh, where materials are, let's say you use materials that can go to 2000 degrees, but you run the reactor at 1000 degrees. You're in a nice sweet spot of solid state physics, but you are nearly subcritical and you, you're in a steep part of the curve. And so you can fiddle it, that you can switch your reactor off just by it getting too hot. So uh, that is the, uh, the theory behind the pebble bed reactor, uh, which is to operate hot. And any accident, loss of coolant, whatever, is going to make it get hot and approach a core meltdown, but you make it in refractory materials which can't melt and the reactor will shut down and it will be very hard to start and it will passively cool if you make it small. So there's so many nice physics that you can do to twiddle the engineering design. And now just staying with the, the fuel and the waste, this is a detailed picture. You can look at it on your own, but you can see that um, you may mine the uranium and it's this yellow cake, and then you use it and use it and process it. And at the end of the day, you add some number like, um, I'm not sure if it's in this slide or the next, but one year of operation is one ton of unprocessed high level waste. And you put that in a, in a pool. And, and, and so this was Fukushima's pool or Kuburg's pool. And at the moment, it's a, like a swimming pool. And in Kuburg, 40 years of operation of unprocessed waste is in this pool. And uh, the economists have told me that the main argument why the world is not processing waste and is not storing waste, it's the same reason South Africa is not, it's because in the price of nuclear is some levy to do final storage of the waste. And, and so uh, this amount is growing and it becomes trillions of rand in the case of South Africa, just as an example. It's bigger than a pension fund. There's this absolute enormous pot of money that is just growing and the interest of it is very very important and you cannot touch it but there's this money there that is just growing with the price of the fuel even when it's 20 cents um, a kilowatt hour as it is now some bit is going in there and this fund is just growing and so there's no incentive to spend it because you, you just leave it in this pool. And, and, and now you will see that for all you know, you never, you're gonna be really glad you didn't bury it one day because there are technologies on the horizon to process it. And, and, and so th th this is a very important thing. But, but anyway, if you did process it, then this estimate is that 40 years of operation of 103 plants of typically one gigawatt each is going to be this amount of waste, of processed waste. It turns out that your big waste issue is a weapons legacy. It's not peaceful use of nuclear power. That 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight multiplier is working for you. You don't have a lot of waste. A nuclear submarine right now fuels once every 10 years. It can go around the ocean. The only thing that makes it come back is to get food for the humans. But 
their reactors are designed to fuel once every 10 years. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that is showing you, you know, there's not a lot of waste. And that's not all you can do. There's this thing now of incinerating the waste, transmutation. And if you look at these curves, if you did nothing, you'd have the red one. And then you'd have a problem in the million year time range. But if you did processing, you bring it down to under 10,000 years. But if you incinerate, you come to 300 years. Uh, you can reduce the volume and you can reduce the time to something that a human can get their head around. Notwithstanding that, this is South Africa's very recently released policy perspective and directive. Very, very, very recent. It's one year old. And South Africa have just committed itself to this policy. It's a centralized interim storage facility, notwithstanding what I just told you. And we are on this roadmap and to have a storage facility in South Africa. And it, it brings me to uh, the next point, which is you can't expect every country in Africa to have its own solution for waste. That's a part where we need Pan-Africa to say, let's have regional storage facilities. It's not a lot of volume. Why should we each have our own? Let's get together as African regions and decide that we will all use a regional repository. And then we all have a solution as Africa somewhere and we can go ahead and start implementing nuclear. One of the barriers to entry is, is this concept that you want as a responsible government to know what you're going to do with all of the, these, these issues. Anyway, um, here's the latest thing. You, you maybe know Kolo Rubia, uh, that he got the Nobel Prize um, in, in a experiment even before LEP uh, in the discovery of the Z. And he got this idea of accelerated driven systems, okay? And it's basically any kind of beam driven system which can incinerate waste. And, and there are a lot of opportunities. The one that he has focused on is the spallation like the European spallation source is seen as quite a model of that. Um, where you have accelerator driven fission as part of the spallation process. And then you will have a lot of neutrons. And if you take the two biggest culprits of fission fragments and you add neutron on uh, this, this reaction, you get to a short-lived daughter. And then that daughter beta decays and becomes stable. So this is the incineration reaction and it applies to the fission fragments. And here is one that applies to the actinides, so the transuranics. So you would fission them and then they would um, also end up to be stable. So wave goodbye to your actinides. And then there are other reactions which- Simon, Kola has other questions. Yeah, Kola. Um, yeah, the, uh, I was asking about, uh, like earlier on you said that uh, you could place a, a, a reactor anywhere, but like it seemed, it seems as though like for the, for the heat exchanger, you, for the heat exchanger, you need a you need a source to cool it. So, it, 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 does that mean that it needs to be placed near a river or ocean? No. You can if you want to use the waste heat to desalinate. 
but um, you get passive, passively cooled systems. Passively cooled systems, what, what does that mean? You can make um, an internal liquid system, but then very, very big. And it's essentially, a, a, um, is like a refrigerator. Uh, it's got very big surface area. Um, and, and then your refrigerant can even be water. And, and it's a closed cycle inside. Uh, it runs like a thermosiphon. I think okay. even Atlas has that concept a very, very big thermosiphon. And then from that, it passively cools. And then there are other devices. You'll see the crusty one that I'll talk about is no cooling. It can, it can be in a vacuum. It can only radiate. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is my um, last slide. I before we go into the actual reactors, um, the idea is to say that, you know, nuclear is a solution for Africa. Uh, we will need to make regional and pan-African consortia. And that basically because startup costs for doing all the bits and pieces are high, you can lower them a lot, uh, as you can see with the, SMRs, um, but we can imagine that the safety problem and the proliferation problem are solved by design. And then the waste problem is solved by the consortia. And then we can happily buy SMR technology in Africa. That is actually the aim of our Nexus group is to be the research underpinning of the proliferation of reactors into Africa. And so in part two, uh, we want to look at these next generation large reactors, the small modular reactors, the micro reactors, the passive safety, fuel once per lifetime reactors, and then doing all these other nice things with them that Egypt started, desalination. Egypt can do one third the water requirement of Cape Town with its reactors that they're building. One third the water requirement of Cape Town. So, so uh, desalination and then the synthetic fuel carriers. So you'll have your hydrogen economy and I personally don't like hydrogen. Okay, I'm always controversial. I don't like batteries. I don't like wind and solar. I don't like hydrogen. But I like synthetic fuel because it doesn't burn in your face and explode on you. So, so I think, yes, everyone can buy windmills and, and, and um, solar cells. But if you want Africa to be wealthy, then please don't stick us on the road to that for, for country level power. So um, we, we should be looking at desalination and liquid synthetic fuel. And, and I'll end it there. And thank you very much. Part one. Simon, thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive uh, uh, presentation on uh, the energy need for Africa and the direction that this team should take. Um, I would like to know if other people have uh, questions or people have comments. Um, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. I guess two questions. One is, I guess in your motivating slides, Simon, you mentioned uh, this new grid versus old. And then in the new, you had uh, something about distributed uh, production. Um, and somehow, I guess you, you didn't really mention that why, how it does not work. Um, so, I mean, I'm just imagining that there must be some kind of distributed uh, distribution in production that works and, and also 
I guess in that some kind of smart grid that might help um, with that. Uh, so that's one question. Maybe you can answer that, then I can ask the second one. When you look at a thing like an ESCOM in South Africa, if you look at the ESCOM in South Africa, you can take the one in America, I don't know what you call it in America, maybe you have many, I think you have many in America, right? many countries in Europe, but that grid is enormous. It's something that a country must do because they believe in it. I sometimes see it similar to, you know, in Nazi Germany, they wanted the Third Reich to last a thousand years and they built the foundations of industry and infrastructure to last a thousand years. You can't, as a political party that's worrying about being voted or not the next cycle, do that. And, and that's what I want the ANC and actually the Africa Union to think like. They want Africa to last a thousand years. And then what infrastructure are you gonna do as a continent, as a region, as a government, not worrying on your lifetime, but to last a thousand years. And I think the Afrikaners of apartheid were like that, like the... Uh, uh, Simon, I'm asking about something uh, the opposite of what you are saying. I'm not asking about the big grid, I'm asking distributed. And by, by distributed, you can imagine, for example, each village producing their own power or each city producing. So you have distributed production. And I don't mind that, okay, asking me personally, I don't mind that, but if you think village, Africa will be a village. But if you think megatropolis, Africa will be a megatropolis. And that's really what I'm trying to go to is say, you can have a mini grid, you can have a micro grid, but at the end of the day, you want to have heavy industry. You want to have a very green... No, no, no. I don't know what you mean. Uh, distributed grid doesn't mean small. I think an equivalent thing is in terms of telephones, where old telephone uh, systems had to lay this, you know, lines everywhere, and then the cell phone came and you essentially then had distributed networks of cell phones where in your hand, you, 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 you <coughs> had that. Excuse me. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean that the communication went down because you had <coughs> this distribution of, you know, uh, in, in the way that cell phones happen. In fact, you got a lot of flexibility and all that. Someone still had to put up the satellite communication system for the whole planet. I'm just worried that if your mindset is on the micro, that's where you're going to be. So I don't want to knock, you know, someone makes a clinic in a rural area and then they put a windmill and a solar cell. I don't want to knock that, but that's not what this talks about. This talks about Africa becoming wealthy. And you can't achieve that with the kind of thinking uh, like that. It's just the bottom line. So, so grids, when you do the maths of grids, okay, they, they have stability issues and they get stabilized by so-called big rotating machines. There's not yet any other solution to stabilize a grid. So if, if you have, um, I know people who have rooftop solar, okay? And then they tell me they generate electricity 80% the price of ESCOM. And that's true because ESCOM is not only generating but also transmitting and distributing. And that's let's say 60% of the, of the fee that they charge. 
So of course they can generate, only generate, because they're not doing, they, they, they not, they just piggyback on the grid like a parasite. If they do, they're not themselves paying for the grid. I see it as like someone who rides a bicycle and says, I'm off road. I don't, I don't make carbon with a car. I ride a bicycle, I'm off road. But they buy food in the shop that got bought by, brought to the shop by a truck, or they go and get healed in a hospital where the infrastructure of the hospital depended on the road or something like that. It's, it's like the national health system where you say, I'm a private hospital, uh, I'm off national health system. But you live in a country where a lot of people can't be in a private hospital and you depend on everyone else in that same country. So no one is off national health system. No one is off road. Same way no one is off grid. And, okay. and otherwise you must go live on a little island and generate only your small amount of solar and wind on your island. We, we, um, we in a community and, and with that, you know, you've got to have a mine and those people who are down in the mine, they want to know there's electricity to bring them up. And that means grid and, and so on. So, so um, that's, that I think is the origin. Uh, you can have small independent power producers, you can have, and we won't knock them. There's room, let them be there. But a when you question, want terawatts. Okay, a second one that's unrelated is, I mean, the green econ uh, uh, energy economy is really um, young, like, you know, 10, 15 years, really. And so where did like nuclear lose it so that they've actually taken off to such a level that uh, now you have to actually like commit time to saying how bad they are. I mean, if nuclear is so good, where did they lose the plot to, you know, to like... Okay. So yeah. there, there are a few reasons. I would say that the birth of nuclear was more with a bomb and a weapon than with a power station. And so in order to have fissile material, you needed the kind of reactor that could give you that. And so the first accepted designs, regulated designs, were driven by a, a, a correspondence that there could also be development of other uh, fish, fissionable <coughs> aerial, okay? And there, there's, there's famous uh, stories about, let's say, thorium reactors or other reactor systems which were progressing at that time that were stifled. And only now today we're going back to them. And we're going back to them in a condition of much tighter regulation. Then another reason is the affordability of nuclear. So um, I know someone whose claim is, and, and it's a very interesting claim, that the only argument against nuclear after you approach scientifically safety, sustainability, green, do everything, the only argument against nuclear is it needs such a high capital cost, which cannot be sustained in a human lifetime. It needs a government level intervention, okay? So you will find in purchasing of nuclear power stations, there's intergovernmental agreements. So when that whole thing broke out in South Africa that we wanted to buy from the Russians, it was suspicion that South African government was talking to Russia on government level, not bank level. So, so then that's the one aspect of it is that the finance is so difficult. And, and so uh, the whole system is built to favor independent power producers and not country scale implementation of a policy. 
when politicians have to worry about being re-elected, they need wins on the four-year time scale, not on the 50-year time scale. And then another reason that has also been put is that in nuclear, the regulation is very tight. So for example, you can't say uh, to wind scale or, or to Arriva or to Rosatom, I want um, this VVR 100, but I, I want it with, I don't know, fries on the side, so to speak and you specify some mod, you cannot. You must buy exactly what is being sold because that is the thing that has been agreed to by the regulator. And so there's very little scope for tenderpreneurs and very little scope for middle people who want to fleece it because this is the price, this is what's in it, it's tightly specified, you can't have uh, backhand deals. And so the, the scope for corruption in nuclear is in fact much less than in anything else. And so people who want to make money will stay away from it. And I think now I've given you three reasons and it's hoped that going to small modular reactors will put nuclear into the same arena as wind and solar because if you buy now a reactor that is uh, let's say 200 megawatts and it's pre-manufactured in the factory and they bring it along and install it same as a windmill and and so it's up and running in whatever one year and it's not the huge behemoth of the two gigawatts like we've got down at Fuburg. So, so um, if, you, if you want, then the nuclear industry needed to evolve to small modular reactors because that's the financial model that can be achieved in terms of how humans do business at the moment. Thanks, Simon. I have to leave. By the way, Simon, our other meeting is starting and there's, there's just going to be Pedro with those guys. So I'm going to leave. Maybe you'll okay. join us as well. Thank you. Sure. Um, there is a question here. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Simon, for the lecture. Um, um, I have a question and comment. Uh, my question is, uh, are there is any international policy, for example, regarding uh, initiating and building uh, reactors, for example, or uh, um, what I can say is like, is it possible for every country to build the reactor if uh, they want to do that or not? I think they can. Any country can can do that. They they would need to establish um, a national regulator. So so there is this overhead to establish the national regulator. There are plans um, to advise Africa that there could be um, a regulation which could transcend again small countries and be regional. So, so definitely, you know, you, you can't have a reactor unless you show you have a competence to regulate it. And that competence should be your own competence. I think I'm not so worried of nuclear scientists, nuclear engineers, nuclear technicians, because uh, that's just five years away. You can train them. And and then uh, it's the issue of what do you choose to spend your money on? So now you have seen, uh, we, we'll look at it, but, but Egypt has, I think they've made a decision, you know, they want the smart city in, near Alexandria and they've, they're going to have um, desalination and nuclear energy. And that maybe will 
boost Egypt's economy enormously. So, so um, you know, the, the reactors got a 90% capacity factor or load factor. Um, is, but, but Simon, is it practical and even recommended for every African country to go into that direction? Is it more economical and, and more, you know, commendable for regional type of, uh, uh, you know, work on in that direction uh, we have 54 countries some of them have only few million people um do you think that if it is a regional type of uh, venture it will be more beneficial to the continent or even if it is continental type of ventures if you if you look at the designs of the smrs there are some that they have two operators in the control room just because it's in our mindset that you must have an operator in the control room but in principle you fuel it and walk away from it for 10 years is is it in in principle it doesn't need an operator and and so if you ask yourself you know you could put a huge wind farm with lots of maintenance a huge solar farm where you must have armies of people to go and clean, uh, cut cut vegetation back, whatever. Or you just have a maintenance free, essentially, heat source and, and gives you 90% load factor, even if it's a small uh, SMR, 200 megawatts. So very definitely, it, Absolutely, definitely, a, these are solutions for countries without well-developed grids yet, because they're not big. They can have many grid situations, and 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 they can be countries without a huge uh, power infrastructure. A size of two hundred megawatts is well matched to a small city. So I really, really, really um, believe that um, the SMR is a very viable alternative. You will see a mine, the cobalt mine that we talked about in the Congo, maybe runs on 100 megawatts. Give it a SMR. You don't have to run a power cable to it. Can have its own microgrid just there at the mine. Um, okay, Simon, I think we have uh, discussed a lot. There's one thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is related to this talk, but in a different context. Um, in the strategy that we are developing, it seems to me that we should extend it by adding the group on uh, the energy needs for, for Africa, which uh, would have the reactors and maybe later the fusion and also um, the, the, the renewables there, although they may have you know, their own issues, um, it could also be discussed. I think, I think the issue of uh, energy for Africa is very serious and impact development at all levels. And it could be something that we want to add uh, as, a, as, as, as a group of, uh, in our strategy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so that's what um, our Nexus group really wants to do is be able to provide the research underpinning. So if someone needs to model a, a grid, model a grid, for example, and you put wind and solar on it, uh, you know, what are you going to do when the sun's not shining and the wind doesn't blow? Are you going to put batteries with the hydro? Or should you not be thinking of a nuclear power station? In, in you can couple them together. In, in a lot of people are saying nuclear enables renewable. There, there are designs that you can put molten salt 
uh, in the cooling cycle of the nuclear, and it's equivalent to the concentrated solar molten salt, and gives you an incredible load following ability. So you, let's say you have a SMR with 200 megawatts, but it's dumping, it, it always runs flat out at 200 megawatts. The reactor doesn't load follow, but it dumps into molten salt and then it load follows between 300 and 100, just from the molten salt. So, so then you have uh, the turbines and everything um, that, that drive the coolant in the, in the, in the reactor. Uh, they, they don't ramp. So they last very long because constant power and they overproduce when the duck is low, underproduce when the duck is high and stick it in molten salt. And, and so th those are some very, very interesting designs. Um, and, and then you could couple them with wind and solar and the wind and solar is doing what it does, highly erratic. But if people want to see a windmill, because they need to, they want to see a solar cell, because they need to, then a, a, a SMR with molten salt can do that job. The load following on a SMR with molten salt is calculated to ramp something like 50% in 30 seconds. It's the fastest load following practically that you can imagine. So, so um, very definitely the, the SMR manufacturers are that aggressive to see nuclear enabled solar, nuclear enabled renewables. Renewables right. have to have something. Okay, so um, that sounds uh, uh, very good. Um, in the interest of time, I suggest that uh, we stop for today and then uh, we have another lecture by Professor Simon Connell next week. Uh, so this, is, this should all be very nice and interesting. So I'll keep my question for next time. Okay, that sounds that's fine. Okay. Um, all right, so I will close the meeting now. Thanks everybody for connecting. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Bye, everybody.